morning, uh, friends. Uh, Mark Milwee, Trinity, Alabama, uh, Mount View Baptist Church. I want to continue our study uh, through uh, the Bible today uh, with a lesson from John chapter 6. So if you want to grab your Bibles, uh, we'll uh, dig in there in just a moment. I've uh, given our uh, lesson today the title, Man Does Not Live by Bread Alone. Man Does Not Live by Bread Alone. Now, you might remember that uh, chapter 5 ended uh, dramatically with Jesus uh, telling the scribes and Pharisees that it was not going to be him that would um, uh, accuse them on the day of judgment, but it, w but it was going to be Moses. Uh, listen to what he says to them. Uh, Do not think that I'll accuse you to the Father. There is one who accused you, Moses, on whom you have set your trust. Uh, uh, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Uh, if there was one man that the Jewish authorities uh, honored and revered more than any other, it was Moses. He, he was the great lawgiver. He's the one that led them out of the wilderness, uh, I mean, excuse me, out of Egypt, through the wilderness, right up to the edge of the uh, promised land. And, and um, uh, Jesus turns the tables on them and he says, you know, it's going to be uh, Moses that stands to accuse you on the day of judgment because Moses wrote about me. Uh, but you refuse uh, to believe in me. Uh, this is important to uh, remember today as we get started uh, because uh, we're going to see that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of many of the things that Moses did write about. In fact, in our study today, we're going to sit back and watch as Jesus feeds the 5,000 with five barley loaves and two fish. Uh, I mean, it's an incredible miracle. But even that is not enough to convince everyone that Jesus is the Son of God. In fact, it becomes very clear that some are only following Jesus because they want him to give them uh, more food. Uh, Jesus says as much down in verse uh, 26, if you drop down there, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, but not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Uh, he goes on to tell them to work for food that, uh, not, not, not to work for food that perishes, but for food that uh, endures to eternal life. Uh, they're seeking material blessings. Jesus wants them to seek uh, spiritual blessings. Uh, they just want more bread, but Jesus came to offer so much more. They were following, not because of their love and devotion to him, but because they wanted something from him. Which brings up a good question uh, I want to ask uh, as we get started uh, today. What motivates you to follow Jesus? What is your motivation uh, for being a Christian? Are you really following uh, because you believe that he is the Son of God, or are you just following because you want something from him? Well, look at verse 30. Um, it says, uh, the people say to Jesus, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, I know I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but you got to understand, they make this statement uh, the very next day. <laughs> after he fed the 5,000 with two fish and five barley loaves. I mean, it's incredible that they still want a sign. Apparently, it was not enough that he fed the 5,000. It's kind of like people today who, after the resurrection, who, who say they still want proof that Jesus is the Son of God. What more proof do you need? Uh, they, they wanted Jesus to give them manna from heaven, uh, they say, just like Moses did. However, Jesus corrects their misunderstanding. Uh, he says, beginning verse 32, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So Jesus is reminding them it, it wasn't Moses that gave them the bread from heaven. It was God. Uh, notice also what he does here because it's really important for our discussion uh, today. He moves the conversation from the realm of the physical to the spiritual. The people want manna, they say, like God gave in the wilderness, but Jesus says that he is the true bread who came down from heaven and gives life uh, to the world. And, and now, just like the woman at the well who said, uh, give me this water so that I'll never thirst again, uh, the people say to Jesus in verse 34, sir, give us this bread always. They wanted this bread so they wouldn't have to work for it. They wanted to follow only for the benefits Jesus could provide. They were looking to have their physical appetite satisfied. But Jesus is offering something much, much more substantial. He came to satisfy the spiritual hunger in their soul if they'll just open their eyes and see it. He didn't just come, somebody said, he didn't just come to sustain life. He came to give life. 
I put forward too hard on these folks, so we have to honestly admit that sometimes our motives are not always pure. We come to the Lord for the many of the same reasons. We follow with the expectation of receiving benefits. Uh, this is why I gave our, our, our sermon, our message, uh, the title of the day, Man Does Not Live By Bread Alone. We need to check our motives and make sure that we're following the Lord for all the right reasons. He is the bread of life, and he is worthy of all worship and honor and glory and praise just because of who he is, not because of what he can do for us. So let's jump in and see what uh, application we can make to our life uh, today. Uh, look at verse 1. After this, Jesus went uh, to, away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the fast Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. So the chapter begins by simply saying, after this. This means sometime after this encounter in the temple uh, with the scribes and Pharisees, uh, Jesus and his disciples, they, they make their way over uh, to the Sea of Galilee. Verse 2 says a large crowd was following along because they had witnessed all the miracles. And, and so now they're up on the mountainside. Uh, they sit down to rest. Uh, John even tells us it's the time for the Passover. Uh, uh, look at verse 5. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. This brings us to the first truth that I want to share with you this morning. Our faith is sometimes tested to discover our true motives. Our faith is tested to discover our true motives. Uh, look again at verse 6. He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Jesus already knew what he was going to do, but the text says he asked Philip this question to test him. The word used here uh, for test uh, means a proving experience. He wanted to see how Philip would respond uh, to this question, and unfortunately he failed the test. Uh, look again at the question, verse 5, where are we to buy bread so these people may eat? Scholars say it's only natural for Jesus to single out Philip and ask him this question because this is the area of the country where Philip grew up. If any of the disciples were going to know where they could find bread, it would have been Philip. Uh, some have also pointed out that they think it was a leading question and that Philip, you know, was just answering the question. Uh, he wasn't even thinking about a test or any other options. But look at his answer, verse 7. Uh, Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough uh, for each one to get a little. A single... Denarius was what one could expect for a day of work during this time period. This is why some translations say eight months' wages would not be enough to buy everybody a, a bite. So, so Philip's, for, Philip's first thought turns to money. I mean, if you notice, he didn't really even answer Jesus' question. Jesus asked, where can we buy bread so these people may eat? He didn't answer the where question. Because he was concerned with the how question. In his mind, it didn't matter where the closest store was. Uh, uh, they didn't have enough money to buy the bread anyway. He counted the cost, and he thought it was impossible. But listen, impossible is not in God's vocabulary. How quickly Philip forgot who he was dealing with. He was already, uh, he had already witnessed turning the water in, into wine. He saw that uh, Jesus healed the uh, ruler's daughter from a distance. He just said the word and she was healed. They just left Jerusalem where Jesus had healed a man who had been an invalid for uh, 38 years. But in this scenario, he assumed that Jesus was attempting uh, the impossible because he didn't think he had enough money. But again, before we're too hard on Philip, I can't tell you how many times through the years I've been sitting in finance committee meetings and somebody will bring up something that they believe the Lord, you know, really wants us to do. And almost invariably the response uh, will be, well, where do you think we're going to get the money to do that? We forget that our father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We forget that where God guides, God provides. I, I like what somebody called the Philip mentality. Uh, he said this, he said, there will always be a deficit because he who looks to mammon instead of to the master will always come up short. He who looks to mammon instead of the master will always come up short. And that's why Philip failed the test. But Andrew did not do much better. Look at verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. 
but what are they for so many? It's good that Andrew went out and found this little boy with a lunchbox. It's good that he brought him to Jesus. Andrew was always bringing people to Jesus. In fact, he almost got it right. If he had just stopped halfway through verse 9, he would have got it right. He would have been showing faith. If he had have just said, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But he didn't stop there. Instead, um, he said, but what are they for so many? He also forgot who he was dealing with. He looked over the situation. He went out and found a potential solution. But after he assessed the state of affairs, he came up to the same conclusion that it was impossible. I mean, really, if you stop and think about it, the little boy is the only one who showed faith in this situation. Andrew must have asked him if uh, he was willing to bring his lunch, uh, you know, to Jesus, and he didn't hesitate. He bought his five barley loaves and two fish. He, he didn't protest when Jesus took them from him and, and blessed them. He allowed the Lord to take the little that he had and use it to bless others. He passed the test. He understood that little is much when God is in it. He was willing to be used by God, and because of his faith, a tremendous miracle takes place this day. I like how one of my commentaries put it. It said, the practical lesson is clear. Whenever there is a need, give all that you have to Jesus and let him do the rest. And I believe the practical lesson for us is that sometimes God allows testing in our lives to see how we are going to respond. Are we going to trust him for the answer? Are we going to step out in faith? Are we going to give him whatever we have and let him do the rest? Or are we going to throw up our hands and say, it's impossible? Listen, impossible is not in God's vocabulary. He can take our little and turn it into much as we call on his name. Well, that's the first truth I want to share. Well, here's the second one. Now, Jesus uh, reveals his true motives. Uh, uh, look at the text beginning in verse 10. It says, uh, Jesus said, uh, have the people sit down. Now there was a grass in that place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their field, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who's coming to the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him their king, uh, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Well, it's interesting uh, to note that uh, this is the only miracle that's recorded in all four Gospels. And it's no wonder it's an incredible miracle. I mean, if you look carefully, you'll notice it says that there were 5,000 men in the crowd. So if we include women and children, this number, uh, you know, swells to like ten to 15,000. And, and the text says they were all fed from five barley loaves and two fish. Notice also Jesus doesn't scold the disciples for their lack of faith. Instead, he just gives them something to do. He tells them to have everybody sit down in groups, and then he asks them to distribute the food. However, before he does this, uh, carefully look at what the text says, verse 11. Uh, Jesus then took the loaves. When he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they uh, wanted. Now, if you drop down to verse 23, other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. I told my Sunday school class recently that anytime something's repeated in the Bible, we need to sit up and, and, and take notice. Well, as I already said, this is the only miracle of Jesus that's repeated in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all state that Jesus looked up to heaven as he gave thanks. In our text today, John mentions twice that Jesus gave thanks before he performed the miracle and distributed the food. This reminds us of the truth from James 1.17, Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, uh, with whom there is no variation or shifting of shadows. Uh, uh, the Bible says that everybody ate their fill. Uh, the, the, the Greek word literally means they were glutted. <laughs> kind of like me when I'm coming out of the catfish place. Uh, they ate everything they wanted and more, and they were stuffed. And they had 12 baskets full of leftover. Uh, one basket for each disciple. Now look at verse 14 again. Now, when, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. This is where Moses uh, comes into play uh, again because uh, Bible scholars believe they responded to something Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 18. 
In Deuteronomy uh, 18, uh, beginning verse 15, this is what Moses says. Uh, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him uh, you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see his great fire any more lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Therefore, when the people say, This is indeed the prophet who's coming to the world, they are referring to this passage that Moses wrote many, many years earlier. In fact, verse 15 says, After they, they said this, they were ready to take him and make him their king by force. Now, John doesn't tell us, but Matthew and Mark both record that at this point, Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and leave. <laughs> I'm sure the disciples would have been very happy for the crowd to have made Jesus their king. Uh, that, this is what some of them have been waiting for the whole time. If Jesus had been made king, you know, they would become very, very important people in his kingdom. Uh, but this is not accord, according to God's plan. Uh, that's why Jesus puts them in the boat and sends them on their way while he dismisses the crowd and goes up on the mountain to pray. As he does this, I believe Jesus reveals his true motives. He did not come to establish an earthly kingdom. He came to establish a spiritual kingdom. He did not come to be exalted by men, but to humbly obey the will of his Father. He understood his time had not yet come. Therefore, he dismissed the crowd and sought to be alone. Although they referred to him as a prophet in verse 14, sought to make him their king in verse 15, Jesus knew and understood what they really needed was a Savior. And of course, he would eventually be the promised prophet, and, and he would become the king of kings. But, but even more importantly, he is the savior of the world who gave his life away as a ransom for many. But it wasn't time for that yet. So he sends everybody away, including the disciples. Look at verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got in the boat, started across the Sea of Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to where they were going. This is one of the interesting things about um, studying all four Gospels. Three of the four Gospels that record this miracle. And they all focus on a dis different aspect of the story. Uh, the other Gospels uh, put a great deal of stress on Peter's attempt to walk on the water, but John doesn't even mention it. Instead, he points out that out in the middle of the lake, in the middle of the night, they're rolling along during a terrible storm, and all of a sudden they see Jesus walking toward them on the water, and it scared them half to death. And we can't blame them. Uh, it's not every day you see somebody walking on the water. They were exhausted. They were, they were tired. Uh, they see what they think is a ghost. Uh, uh, look at what Jesus says to them, though, in verse 20. It is I. Do not be afraid. This is what John puts the stress on. Literally, uh, it is I in, in the Greek is ego I me. It's exactly the same as saying the I am is here. The I am is here. Now listen to me. I don't know what struggle you might be going through today, but I want you to always remember that Jesus is right there with you in the middle of the storm. And he's saying to you, just like he said to the disciples, that it is I, ego I, me. The I am is here. Don't be afraid. It's comforting to know that in the midst of the storms of our life, our Savior is right beside us encouraging us not to be afraid. And, and as a result, when the disciples realized who it was, they gladly took him into the boat. And the text says immediately the boat was at the land to where they were going. Now, John is the only one to record this aspect of the miracle. I, I don't know how it happened, but once Jesus got in the boat, they immediately reached their destination, which I think it highlights the fact it's, it's important to have Jesus in, in the boat with you. <laughs> but he revealed his true motives through both of these miracles. The feeding of the 5,000 and the miracle on the water both illustrate that he came to establish a, a spiritual kingdom as the Savior of the world. And in fact, somebody pointed out that both of these stories lay the groundwork for the very first I am statement that we're going to get to in verse uh, 35. Um, 
it says, it's where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Here, here's what the Bible scholar said. He said, the feeding event supplies a theological vehicle, the bread, and the greeting or address of Jesus in the water story supplies the familiar I am formula. When these two are combined or put together, the theological assertion becomes, I am the bread of life. And, of course, the verse ends by saying, Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus will satisfy the spiritual hunger in our soul as we put our faith and trust in him. His motive is to do the will of the Father and provide a way for our salvation. Well, now, beginning in verse 22, we see uh, how the people show their true motives. Uh, look at what it says. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples. But that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got in the boat and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. They all knew that Jesus uh, was not in the boat that left with the disciples, that he had sent them away. Uh, they knew that he had gone up on the mountain to pray. But when they come looking for him the next day, they can't find him. So they head over to Capernaum, which was, you know, uh, where Jesus centered a lot of his Galilean ministry. Uh, look now at verse 25. Uh, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Now, I ask at, you know, the beginning of our message uh, today, uh, what is your motive for following Jesus? What motivates you to follow him? Are you following because you truly believe that he is the son of God? Or uh, is it just that you're wanting something from him? Well, it's very clear that the people were following for the wrong reasons. This is why Jesus says uh, to him in verse 26, they're, they're not following because saw the signs but because they ate their fill of the loaves um, they're not following because they love and are devoted to him but, but, but they want something from him and Jesus listen he can see straight through their hypocrisy this is why he says in verse 27 do not work for food that perishes but for food that endures to eternal life which the son of man will give to you for on him God has set his seal uh, they're still seeking material blessings but Jesus wants them to receive spiritual blessings they want more bread, but Jesus came to offer spiritual bread. He encourages them uh, to work for food that endures to eternal life, which he says the Son of Man, his favorite term for himself, uh, he says will give to you. He even says that God has placed his seal of approval on him. So this leads the people to ask an important question. They say, what must we do to be doing the works of God? It's actually a very good question. And notice Jesus' answer. This is the work of God that you believe in him. Whom he has sent. That's about as straightforward as answer as you're ever going to get uh, from, from Jesus. He says, the work God requires of you is to believe in him whom he sent. In, in other words, Jesus is saying, my job is to provide for your salvation. Your job is to believe in me. The only work required uh, is to believe in God's one and only son. But for some reason, you know, we, we think there's got to be a lot more to it. We think we've got to do something to earn our salvation. We've got to work for it. But over and over and over in the New Testament, we're told to believe and be saved. Now, obviously, there's more to belief than just mental assent. Uh, uh, you know, to believe in Christ is to commit our life to Christ. Uh, the Bible says even the demons believe and shudder. So th there must be more to belief than just saying, well, sure, I believe in Jesus. We, we step out in faith and we entrust our lives to him. It's more than just head knowledge. It's heart knowledge. But this is when the people speak up and say they want more proof. Uh, they refer to Moses, you know, giving them manna in the wilderness. And we already talked about all that in the introduction. Uh, they're just like the woman at the well, you know. She said, give me this uh, uh, living water so I'll not be thirsty anymore. They want this bread so they won't have to work for it. But Jesus responds to all this by saying in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus says exactly what we've been talking about. He says that whoever comes to him and believes in him will never be hungry or thirsty again. Now, he's not talking about physical hunger and physical thirst. He's talking about spiritual hunger and spiritual thirst. Jesus came to satisfy our spiritual needs if 
we'll put our faith and trust in him. He didn't just come to sustain life. He came to give life. He is the bread of life. And those who come to him have their spiritual hunger and thirst quenched. As we do that, we receive him just like we do uh, physical food. We eat and drink and our physical appetite is, is satisfied. Well, in the same way, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he comes into our life and our spiritual needs are met. He offers true and lasting satisfaction. He says that those who come to him will not hunger. Those who believe in him will never thirst again. It's an incredible promise from an incredible Savior. So let me ask you a question. Would you be willing to commit your life to the bread of life? He wants to satisfy your spiritual hunger and your spiritual thirst today if you'll only trust him. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for watching today.